All right, so let's talk about the cells of the immune system. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the idea of white blood cells being your body's defense, and that is certainly true. Um, white blood cells and a few related cell types are the main cellular defense of your body, and they play a role in both the innate and acquired immune response. Some of them play a pretty big role in both systems. Um, but you've got a bunch of different types of them, and, uh, and they each kind of do subtly different things. So keep in mind, this is one of those things that would probably make a pretty good matching question. So I'm going to go through and explain the main roles of each of these uh, cell types to you. Um, and there are three big categories of cell types. Uh, first, we have what are called the granulocytes. And there are three granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, next, we have the lymphocytes. And there are three-ish types of lymphocytes, uh, B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. And we'll see that there's actually a few different types of T cells later on. But for our purposes now, just get those three. And then we have uh, what are called mononuclear phagocytes. And uh, there are a couple of different types of those. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about monocytes, dendritic cells, and macrophages. And uh, each of these cell types has a different job. Um, and I'm going to compare them to kind of like military function. Uh, realize that this is a metaphor. You know, it's not exactly true. Uh, but they actually pr fit, fit pretty well into some of these roles. So first are the neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most abundant leukocyte in your blood. And uh, leukocyte just means white blood cell. So all white blood cells are leukocytes. Uh, neutrophils are a granulocyte, uh, and they're so named because they have these little granules inside of them that stain, and you can see them when they stain. So they have these little granules inside. In terms of appearance, uh, neutrophils are about medium size. They're perhaps the size of uh, two red blood cells. All right, so about twice the size of a red blood cell. Uh, they have these very distinctive multi-lobed nuclei, anywhere between three and seven lobes. So you can see this one up here has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, wait. Yeah, so that's a, this one's got a lot of lobes to its nucleus, and you can kind of see that it has these lightly stained granules in, uh, in its cytoplasm. They're usually going to be small and relatively lightly colored. Uh, the role of the neutrophil is they're the infantry, right? They're the army. They are the most abundant. Uh, they are your front line of defense. So, uh, you know, no matter what it is that you've got going on, neutrophils are probably the first thing you send in to go kill it. Now, a few things to keep in mind. One, neutrophils are not constantly active. You know, just like the, the the infantry doesn't usually just like go on patrol around a city looking for bad guys. They get sent to a place to do a thing on a mission. Um, and when they're not activated, they like they're on base, they're training, doing stuff like that, but they aren't 
you know, beat cops. They aren't walking around looking for trouble. Um, and neutrophils are the same way. They circulate around your body. They don't, um, they don't usually become active until they receive a chemical signal telling them to activate and attracting them to a particular area. And when that happens, they show up at that area and they take care of business. Usually that involves killing a bunch of things that, um, that are there. And they have three main methods of killing stuff. First is phagocytosis. So they are, um, they, they are phagocytic, which means they can like put out this little mouth that's going to surround something and eat it. Right? They can eat things, they can digest them. Yeah, that's the first thing that they do. Uh, second thing that they have to attack with is their granules. Uh, these granules inside of them are like little packets of, uh, uh, of perforins and peroxidases, um, which are two proteins. Perforins poke holes in cell membranes. So um, most cells don't like having holes poked in their membranes. And so if the... Uh, uh, the granulosa, or if the neutrophil, like, degranulates, <clears throat> it's going to release all of these, um, these perforins that are going to poke holes, uh, in, in whatever happens to be around. And, uh, peroxidases, which are going to get in through the holes, and then they're going to make what are called, uh, peroxides and free radicals. And those are just going to run around destroying everything. Now, there's a few things to know about this. Uh, first off, this is kind of like a, uh, a an explosion. This is like a grenade, right? When it goes off, it's going to kill everything in the surrounding area, the friend and foe alike. Uh, and your immune system is totally cool with that. Um, your immune system is like, your body is not a happy, friendly democracy. Your body is a totalitarian dictatorship. And your body expects every cell that you have to be willing to die for the cause at any moment. So these neutrophils are going to be totally willing to wreck and destroy your cells if they get caught in the blast radius. In fact, the first thing that gets killed by these peroxidases and, and, and perforins is usually the white blood cell that released them. Um, so it gives up its life in order to take out a bunch of stuff with it. Uh, the third way that it has of attacking things is this like multi-lobed nuclei. It can actually sort of spit out and vomit out its DNA that will then link together forming this giant net that's going to capture a whole bunch of stuff inside of the net and bind them together, right? It's actually really, really cool, right? They, they can take their DNA and just like, whoa, make this huge web trap with it. Um, obviously, this kills the cell because it just jettisoned its DNA, uh, but it can, like, capture a whole bunch of things and immobilize them, allowing other cells to show up and kill them. So, neutrophils, most abundant Usually first on the spot, phagocytic, granules, DNA web. Uh, so next we have eosinophils. Uh, eosinophils are so named because they stain with the eosin red dye. And they usually have bilobed nuclei, so they're sort of like two lobes connected. Uh, and they have these big red granules, uh, usually very dense. If you see these cells on a slide, sometimes they can look totally just dark. Like they have all of these, these red granules all throughout them. Uh, eosinophils are pretty rare. They're like 1% to 3% of circulating um, uh, white blood cells. And... Uh, they are kind of like your special forces. They're, you're rare, 
they're they're rare. You don't have very many of them, um, but you send them in to deal with stuff that other parts of your immune system just can't deal with. Um, specifically, they tend to deal with parasitic infestations, things like worms, right? If you have, like, you know, tapeworm or something in your gut, well, it's pretty big. Like, tapeworm is... is huge compared to cells um and uh so like neutrophils are going to come up to it it's way too big for them to eat uh it is um you know they're going to deploy their granules against it it's going to laugh at those uh you know they're going to throw their nets at it and it's too big for them to catch it there's not a whole lot that neutrophils can do against these parasitic worms uh, but eosinophils, their granules are filled with, um, uh, with anti-helminth and anti-parasitic chemicals. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that they work. I don't want to get into too much detail, um, but they work in concert with certain antibodies, particularly IgE, and they're really effective at getting rid of these parasites. They're really kind of one of the few things that can. Uh, so that's eosinophils. Then we have basophils, which are quite rare, but extremely important. They're less than 1% of circulating white blood cells. Uh, but these are your body's um, scouts. So let me actually put this stuff in here. Army. Special forces. These are your scouts and guards. Um, they don't actually directly attack things, for the most part. Um, what they do is their granules, which, by the way, are quite dark and quite dense, are filled with uh, histamine and heparin. And when... Uh, and, and your basophils have these special receptors on them that can detect bad guys and the other signs that bad guys leave behind. By bad guys, I mean viruses, bacteria, anything that's infecting you, right? Um, and when a basophil detects an infection, it releases its granules. And these are a giant alarm for your immune system. In fact, uh, uh, histamine which is the main thing that they release, is called your body's alarmone, which is like, just means alarm hormone. Um, this is the chemical that initiates the inflammatory response. Uh, and uh, there are lots of other chemicals involved in the inflammatory response, but this is the main one that starts that whole cascade off. So if a basophil uh, detects something floating around in your blood that's bad, like a virus or a bacteria, it's going to release its, uh, its granules of histamine. That histamine is going to start the inflammatory response. And crucially, it's also going to attract a bunch of other white blood cells, most particularly neutrophils. Remember how I said that neutrophils have to be activated before they like zoom into a place and start killing stuff? Well, histamine is one of the things that strongly activates them, All right? So these basophils are going to see something and, uh, you know, raise the alarm. And uh, pretty soon after that, a bunch of neutrophils are going to show up and start killing whatever is around. Um, and I should also say, so this is, this table just has the blood cells. You have some immune system cells which are not necessarily found in your blood. And one of them is what's called a mast cell.
And mast cells are um, pretty much the same as basophils, except instead of circulating around in your blood, they stay embedded in your tissues. So um, basophils are kind of like you know, guards that are floating around in your blood. They're looking for any bad guys that have gotten into your blood um, or into your, your interstitial fluid. Whereas mast cells are most particularly going to be found near your barriers, right? Your skin and mucous membranes are going to have mast cells embedded in them, and they're going to be looking for any invaders that are coming through your barriers and they're going to raise the alarm against them. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that histamine, which remember I said is uh, the thing that is released, or one of the things that's released by basophils, is involved in uh, allergic reactions. Uh, so basophils are actually involved in allergic reactions as well. And they are, uh, when you have an allergy, they are the cell that like freaks out in response to the allergen, releasing its histamine and causing inflammation, which is your allergic response. We'll talk about this more when we talk about allergens. Uh, just keep in mind that basophils are the cell that is that goes wrong in an allergy, or in most allergies. So that's the three granulocytes. Uh, next we have lymphocytes. And like I said, there are three types of lymphocytes. B cells, T cells, and natural killer, which is usually abbreviated NK cells. B cells and T cells, these are the cells of your acquired immune system. These are command and control, right? They're the big brains. Um, what they do is, uh, first off, they coordinate a lot of activity. Uh, lymphocytes produce, especially T lymphocytes, produce chemicals that are going to organize and control and direct the rest of your immune system. Uh, and they also, particularly B cells, produce antibodies. And those antibodies are also something that is going to direct and control your immune system. And B cells and T cells are both capable of learning, right? You've got billions of different B cells and um, like you can learn which one of them makes exactly the right antibody to fight exactly the right thing. And then there's a system that creates memory cells of that antibody. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about the acquired uh, immune system. So these guys, they are memory and direction. Now NK cells, these are your assassins. Um, specifically, like T cells in particular, are very good at detecting uh, your own cells that have either been suborned by the enemy, gone traitor, or that have gone crazy and are trying to kill you. And basically what that means is cells that have been virally infected and cells that have gone cancerous. Right? A virally infected cell has been like turned traitor to the enemy. It's now no longer your cell. Now it's making viruses. A cancerous cell is kind of like a terrorist, right? It's just gone mad and it's going around 
blowing stuff up. And uh, T cells are particularly good at detecting the weird proteins made by virally infected and cancerous cells that these cells have to display on their surface. And um, I'm going to get into more detail in this later on, but what you need to know is that, like I said, your body is not a happy, friendly uh, uh, democracy. It's a dictatorship. Every cell in your body has to carry its papers with it, right? Like its permission slip that says, oh, wait, I'm allowed to be here, and they... they they can be interrogated and they have to show exactly what proteins they're making. So T cells can go up to any cell in your body and go, hey, show me your papers. Uh, you know, what are you doing? Show me the proteins you're making right now. Do it. And those cells have to go, okay, these are the proteins that I'm making. And if the T cell looks at them and says, ah, those are viral proteins, kills the cell. If it says, ah, those are mutant cancer proteins, boom, kills the cell. This is still T cells. Uh, and it has a few different ways of killing the cell, uh, but the main one is that um, all of your cells are built with a suicide switch. All of your cells have a button, a chemical button, and when you push that button, the cell commits suicide. Uh, what, what's called apoptosis. And so the T cell will just go, you know, son, you're making viral proteins there. That means that you've gone over to the enemy. I need you to kill yourself. And most cells will go, yes, sir, and kill themselves. They actually do it in a very uh, organized fashion. They like pack up all of their nutrients into little packages so that they can be recycled easy and they just kind of dissolve. Same with most incipient uh, cancer cells. Now, sometimes cells get so advanced, like viral, some viruses will just like turn off the apoptosis switch. Some cancers will get that switch mutated or broken so that they no longer are willing to kill themselves. And then T cells have to do some other stuff. They release perforins and they release peroxidases to kill those cells. On to the NK cells. One of the tricky things that viruses can do is just tell the cells, nah, stop showing your papers. When the T cell comes up to you and says, hey, show me what proteins you're making, just don't. And they break that system. This happens in cancer cells just randomly, sometimes due to mutations as well, right? And if the T cell, T cells can only kill cells that like make bad proteins. So if the T cell goes up to someone and says, hey, show me what proteins you're making, and that cell goes, nah, and doesn't do it, the T cell's got no other tricks, right? If you, you, you decide not to show it any proteins, well, it can't kill you because it only kills things that make bad proteins. So you need a defense against that. Otherwise, everything's just gonna get all tricky and just go, nah, I'm not showing you any of my proteins. This is where the NK cells come in. Natural killer cells are called natural killers because they can kill cells that uh, don't display antigens. What natural killer cells do is they look for any cell that is refusing to show its proteins. They assume the only reason you would be not showing your proteins is because you're a bad guy and they just kill you. So the, the T cell goes up to a cell and says, hey, show me the proteins you're making. The cell says, no, I'm not going to. T cell wanders off. And K cell shows up and says, hey, show me what proteins you're making. And if you show it a protein, even a bad protein, it's fine. But if you just refuse to show what proteins you're making, NK cell kills you. Um, so they go around like killing 
you know, spies and terrorists, virally infected and cancerous cells, um, and they do so, uh, they, they, they do to any of those that are, like, trying to hide. Last big category is mononuclear phagocytes. Now, the only one of these that's commonly found in the blood is called a monocyte. Monocytes are pretty big. They're like two and a half to three times the size of a red blood cell. They usually have this kind of U-shaped or kidney bean-shaped nucleus. They have a large cytoplasm, which is usually smooth and clear. It doesn't have any granules in it. Um, and they are what are called antigen presenting cells. Or APCs. And um, monocytes can, like, exit the blood. And when they exit the blood, they either become macrophages or they can become dendritic cells. Now, monocytes are mostly found in the blood. Macrophages are mostly found in the tissues. And dendritic cells are mostly found near your barriers. Again, that's your skin and your mucous membranes. Whether it's found, whether we're talking about a monocyte, a macrophage, or a dendritic cell, they all have basically the same job. These are constantly vigilant. So these are kind of like your cops and border guards. Um, these are like your beat cops. They walk around, they're looking for trouble. They are uh, what we would call vigilant cells. Um, and uh, so they can actually detect bad guys. They don't have to be activated. They don't have to wait until, like, a histamine signal comes. In fact, they're often going to be the thing that is alerting the basophil that it needs to make histamine. So monocytes are going to circulate around your blood. Macrophages are going to circulate around your um, organs. Dendritic cells mostly stay put in your barriers. But either way, they have these um, detector molecules that we'll talk about in a future lecture. And if these detector molecules detect a bad guy, a pathogen or a virus or something that might indicate the presence of those, like, you know, bacterial waste products or something like that, um, the first thing that they do is they eat it. They are phagocytes. They eat things. They eat cells. So if a macrophage bumps into another cell, it's going to feel it up and say, hmm, do you look like you belong here? And if, if it looks suspicious, he goes, ah, I don't know, you look kind of suspicious, I'm going to eat you. Boom, it eats it. Tears it up into little teeny tiny shreds, but it doesn't stop there. If you're a good cop or a good guard, right, when somebody's tried to get in and you've captured them, you don't just go, all right, that's decent and at home. Uh, you're going to let someone know about it. So these guys 
will now go to the lymphocytes, B and T cells, and they're going to take the little pieces of whatever it is that they just ate and show them off to the lymphocytes and go, hey, I just captured this thing. Do you know what it is? And they're going to keep doing this until they find the lymphocyte that knows what the hell it is. And uh, the, the, the lymphocyte that knows what it is is going to go, oh, wait, I know how to make antibodies against this. So antigen-presenting cells play a very important role in the immune system. They form a bridge between the, uh, uh, the, the innate immune system and the acquired immune system. They're part of the innate immune system. Like, they wander around looking for bad guys. And when they find them, they get rid of them. They don't have to be activated, but... If you, uh, it, if they are activated in the presence of antibodies or histamine or something like that, they certainly become a lot more active and a lot more suspicious. But they don't require that. Um, the mononuclear phagocytes, uh, antigen-presenting cells, in addition, are also your body's garbage collectors because they eat things. So it's like if there aren't any bad guys for them to eat, then they wander around just picking up junk and digesting it. Um, but if they happen to run across any bad guys, then they're going to go alert the B and T cells. They're also usually going to secrete some chemicals that are going to cause uh, basophils and mast cells to release histamine and raise the alarm. Um... And these guys are going to show up several times in the lectures to come. Now, that's the general role of the cells of the immune system. Uh, a few specific things. Another thing that monocytes, or rather macrophages, can do is uh, some things are too big to eat. And when that happens, a whole bunch of macrophages... Right, and I'm going to draw like this. If there's something that's too big to eat, a whole bunch of macrophages will, like, come together, kind of like Voltron, and make, turn themselves into the one giant cell. It's actually called a giant cell. Um... And uh, this and lymphocytes will actually form this big wall. Sometimes things are too big to eat, but the giant cells will like surround them and then calcify, uh, turning into what's called a granuloma, uh, which is this like calcified, hardened mass of giant macrophages and lymphocytes uh, that will like say, all right, well, we can't, you know, we can't actually fight this thing off, but what we can do is we can wall it away from the rest of the body and stop it from spreading. And they'll often do that to, um, to cancers that have gotten too big, uh, to parasites, to certain um, pathogens, like particularly tuberculosis. So where do all of these white blood cells come from? Well, all blood cells are made from the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, you have what are called uh, hemocytoblasts or hematopoietic stem cells. These are the cells that constantly divide and divide and divide. Uh, and some of them will begin to turn into other types of cells. And the first division they have to make is this hematopoietic stem cell. If it decides it's going to become something, it has to decide, am I going to be a lymph, uh, a lymphocyte, or something else? 
And so it can turn into a lymphoid stem cell or a myeloid stem cell. The lymphoid stem cells can then become all the rest of the lymphocytes, natural killer cells, uh, T cells, B cells. The myeloid stem cells can become megakaryocytes, which then break apart into platelets. They can become erythropoietic cells, which can further differentiate into erythrocytes, which is just a fancy word for red blood cells. They can become myeloblasts, and myeloblasts can then turn into any of the granulocytes. Basophil, neutrophil, eosinophil. Um, myeloblasts, I think, can also become monocytes, and then monocytes can turn into macrophages and dendritic cells. And somewhere in this pathway that we don't entirely understand mast cells come from. We don't know exactly how the myeloid stem cells become mast cells, but we know that they're in that mix somewhere. So these are the cells of the immune system. You know, you should know all of the different cells of the immune system and be able to recognize them based off of their traits, a description of what they do, what they fight against, how they work, what they secrete, anything like that. So like, I might say, this type of cell is involved in allergic response, and the answer would be basophil. Uh, I also might say, this type of cell releases histamine granules, and that would also be basophil. Those are just two different ways of getting at the same answer. 